Hello, welcome to United Church of Hyde Park. We are a church that have two set of sports fans. Yes, we do. We have serious Cub fans and we have serious White Sox fans. And they're serious about their teams. They're serious about who they root for. But I happen to be a fan of another team. I happen to be a fan of the Chicago Sky. They're a WNBA team. And yesterday, my team played against the Connecticut Suns, and we won. It was a score of 100 to 93. And yes, we won. And I'm excited about my team. I think that they're going to the championship. I'm just feeling that. I'm really feeling that in my spirit. So, critics, sport critics are starting to describe this team as selfless. What they're saying about Chicago Sky is that it's not all about them, but that they actually care about their team members, that actually they are willing to pass the ball if they see someone else that has an open, that they support and cheer one another, that they play as a team, that there are many good shooters. And it reminded me of United Church of Hyde Park. We're kind of like that. We care for one another. We root for one another. When we see an opening in a way that we can encourage somebody else, hey, we pass the ball. So I want to welcome all of you that know all about United as a team and those that may not know us as well. You just come to know us through virtual reality. I want to welcome you to United, a team that plays together. I wouldn't say selfless, but I would say concerned and passionate about each other. When a team starts a game, there are five people that usually start off the game. Last week, I pulled a couple of tags up there, and I think some of you have taken your name tags home, because I, I am certain that not all the names are up there on the board. But just imagine today that our team is playing, and in the startup is Mary Lou Manning, Sunita Brooker, Solacy, Lenora, I'm not going to try all these last names, Shirley Johnson and Tracy Lampkins. But it's not just those five. It's all of you that are listening today. We are all a part of this thing called United. We are united across who we root for. We are united by our faith. So I want to welcome you. I want to welcome you to a team that wins all the time because it's rooted and based in love. Welcome to United Church of High Park. Thank you. 
in this place, God welcomes all the dreamers as well as the doubters. Here, the warriors and wanderers can call on God by name. Here in this time, we can remember all the ways that God has graced us. Here, in these moments, we are reminded that God is with us always. Here are gathered those daring enough to step out of comfort into the unknown. Here, in this faith space, we will find the courage to cry out, God save us in every situation. This is the day of new beginnings, time to Step from the past and leave behind our disappointment, guilt, and grieving, seeking new paths and sure to find. Christ is alive and goes before us to show and share what love can do. This is the day. The music team is just playing with us. They're whetting our appetite so that we want more and more. And then they just <laughs> end. Again, we welcome you here to United Church of Hyde Park today. We are reading still in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And we are in the 37th chapter today. And you can flip over, you can go there on your tablets, or you can just close your eyes and listen. We will be reading from verses 1 through 4 and then from verses 12 through 28. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to the pasture, their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, here I am. So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring back a word to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal 
has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and cooking up and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme, I have a dream. I have a dream. So finally, our household got a puppy. Ah. Uh, and we were driving home. And we had had some conversation about how to get the puppy home. And there was some mention of we could carry the puppy in our arms. And we rode with four people in a car. And so, uh, without consulting with everybody, it ends up we picked up the puppy. And there was no crate or nothing other than our arms to carry him in. And so we got back on the road from Indiana. And we were driving home. And the puppy was so peaceful and so kind and so fluffy, and so absolutely beautiful. It almost took our breath away until something else took our breath away. So the puppy started moving around and getting antsy, and it was like, wow, he was so peaceful. And he started moving and wanting to look up at the road, and we passed them around. Of course, the driver could not hold him, but we passed them to a passenger up in the front. And he was looking out the window when all of this warm, gold, liquidy substance exited from his body. If I can be blunt, he shit it all over the person holding him. And let's just say, it was a moment for four humans in a car with a puppy who were relieved, at least three of them, that it wasn't them. Now the person who actually got shitted on said a few colorful words and actually got taken away for a moment as the surprise of this substance landed all over her clothes. And again, I say, the other three of us, while trying to be passionate and kind and empathet empathetic, we're happy that it wasn't us. And I began to think that sometimes, sometimes it is us. And sometimes, sometimes in life we get shitted upon. And when it's you, it never feels good. I never heard someone say, yes, I got defecated on, and yes, it felt good. Because it doesn't. Today, we're looking at the text, and generally, we get caught with Joseph and his big dream. But well, I want to focus on his brothers for just a moment. They are working. They are hardworking. They are out in the pasture. They are helping the father manage his flock. They are ordinary, and it's almost as if their lives are dying in the task of ordinariness. 
You ever feel like that? Like day to day, you're doing the same thing. Your life feels so utterly ordinary. Sometimes the brothers played around and sometimes they goofed off and sometimes they got a little bit off task as brothers might do, even adult brothers. But Joseph was sent to observe them and Joseph would observe everything and Joseph is what we call a tattletale. He would go back and report to the father everything they did. He would report when they were playing around and he became an annoying little brat that would often tell on them. They couldn't get away with anything. It started out as innocent and then the younger brother reporting back to dad was not so innocent. And then there's a tear, you know that tear you get in your clothing that starts off small. It started out small and before you know it, it migrates into something big. Sometimes a sore is just a sore until it festers in the sun. The brothers noticed that their younger brother got more attention. They started to notice how good Joseph looked. They noticed how their father would respond when Joseph gave a report of their behavior. They started to notice the subtleties of favoritism. They started to notice that Joseph got the gifts that no other sibling got. And did you see that coat of many colors? It was like Louis Vuitton designing a garment for the red carpet Oscar himself. Oh my God, there wasn't anything like this coat. It was beautiful and it had lots of colors and it was long and it looked sleek on Joseph's frame. They had never gotten anything close to this coat. So the tear gets a little bit bigger. They could see the glow of the pride in their father's eyes when he looked at Joseph. The tear keeps getting bigger and bigger. The gift and the attention for one child only out of 13. What bothered them more than anything else, the text reveals, is that their dad loved Joseph more than the other kids. Joseph was his favorite, and the tear keeps getting bigger and bigger. They're unable to speak the text as peacefully to Joseph. They grew to hate the hairs on his back. The tear is keeping getting bigger and bigger. These brothers have been shitted on. They had no control over their birth. They had no control over the fact that their dad really never loved their mom, Leah. They had no control over the other two ladies that provided him with kids as well. They had no control over the fact that Joseph was the first son of the love union between Jacob and Rachel. They had no control over how they got here. When it's all said and done, they get, they get shitted on. The brothers hated Joseph. It's one thing to dislike someone. You know, sometimes someone can get on your nerves, but it's quite another to hate someone. You see, hate takes a lot of energy. Hate takes intention. You have to put in a full days of work to hate somebody. We talked about the Titanic last week going down, but hate will sink you. Jealousy, if not abandoned, can lead to hate. Hate is often rooted in jealousy or feeling like someone has done something wrong to you. There were two dorm rooms that shared a bathroom between four college students. Three of the students came from the same county, while the fourth student came from another province. Very early on, it became apparently clear to those three students that the fourth student vehemently hated student A. What dazzled them was why, since they had never met student B. One weekend while student B was away, two of the students found a letter in the bathroom that they shared. They grabbed up student A and showed student A their discovery. And then they pieced together the torn pieces 
of this fragmented letter. It was like a jigsaw puzzle. And as they put the pieces of the paper together, a truth would unfold. Student B, in fact, had a boyfriend, and she had discovered that that boyfriend had cheated on her with a girl that had the same exact name as student A. Are y'all following me? The two students turned to student A and said, that's why she hates you. You, your name, reminds her of someone else. Student B had displaced her anger to her roommate who shared the same name as someone she felt like she hated. You see, hate shuts down empathy. Hate shuts down our ability to think. Hate shuts down our ability to be open to the move of the Holy Spirit. Hate is like a fire that totally consumes us. And we have seen groups of people hated by another group. Nationalism can sometimes be a step in that direction. History shows us over and over again that hate is a very dangerous thing to have in one's heart, no matter how we got there. The brothers hated Joseph. Last week I shared with you that John Lewis said that Martin Luther King shared that it's too much to hold on to hate. It's too heavy a burden to carry. But there was no one to tell these brothers what hate would do to them. And so without guidance, their hate led them down a sharp, slippery slope of plotting the demise of their brother. We gotta get rid of Joseph. Joseph is walking around in the clouds 3,000 feet above sea level. These dreams are vivid, colorful, and so powerful, he thinks he has to share them. But he goes too far, and even his dad says, chill out, boy, chill out. But his dad still wonders in the back of his mind if there might be a little bit of truth to the dream. And one day as Joseph is making his way to his brothers, his brothers that are driven by hate, the brothers see an opportunity to take him out, to get rid of him finally. To be sure the brothers were not on all the same page. Reuben, the oldest brother, had one idea and brothers over here had another idea. So they weren't all on the same page, but they all were on the same page, that Joseph had to go. The brother's problem was not their brother. Do you hear me? The brother's problem was not Joseph. It's ironic how often we displace and put our pent-up feelings on the next most helpless thing. The brothers had a lack of dreams. They had a lack of hope. They had a lack of sense of their own worth. About a decade ago, I did a career day at a, a high school on the west side, and one of the questions I used to engage the high school students who were now juniors and seniors was, what are your dreams? What did they want to do after school? I looked into their eyes, and their eyes were blank. They caught on quickly and started to name they wanted to be crime scene analysts. Too much watching CSI and Law and Order. I started to see how TV consumption was shaping our future. But when I asked about their grades, or what it took to get to where they wanted to go, or what colleges they were thinking about attending to achieve their dreams, it was simple that they really hadn't dreamed, that it hadn't been cultivated in them to dream. The only thing they saw was today and tomorrow. Whole groups of people are robbed of having a dream. The brother interprets Joseph's dream as arrogant rather than a diving, a divine word about their clan's destiny. Joseph did not help the matter, but you have a young teen sharing a dream. What did you expect? Joseph's dream was not just about himself, but it was about the survival of his people. Now, the way he told it probably didn't contribute 
probably did contribute to a few firecrackers being set off, but nonetheless, his dream was big. The title of this passage in my Bible says, Joseph's dream of greatness. This was no because I had a burger last night and I'm working it out in my dream kind of dream. Joseph's dream was a dream that he believed was given to him by God. And he was too young to know sometimes a dream is best kept to oneself. I remember another person who had a dream. Martin Luther King had a dream too, and he shared that dream with thousands at the March on Washington. And his dream was big too, and it was not just a dream for himself. This dream was a dream of a different America that was not just the home of the free for some, but the home of the free for all. His dream was about whole communities being saved from the injustices and despair around them. And his dream also was the urgency of now. Now is the time. We are once again right now living in a time, an urgent time, that calls for us to dream. He dreamed about justice being a reality for all God's children. He had a dream that he would hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women and children are created equal. He had a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the son of former slave owners would be able to sit down together at the table of siblinghood. He had a dream that his four children one day would live in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This is our hope, this is our faith, Martin declared. In other words, the dream was not just about him, but all of us and the fact that we are connected. COVID reminds us that our welfare is connected to one another. Now, I don't want to blame the brothers because they were shitted on, and too often we blame those who are down and out for their own circumstances. With the cards they were dealt, they were set up to lose. It's like the Native Americans in this land that were once beautiful people, but because of how much European immigrants shitted on them, they're displaced and racked with addition and dysfunctional family. Between diseases and greed and a trail of tears and the Wounded Knee Massacre, we decimated a whole group of people that were living peacefully before Columbus and the others came. All over the world are the footprints of certain groups of people bringing one thing, sometimes Jesus, and taking so much more and shitting on whole groups of people. That said, it is important for us to dream no matter how crazy the dream is. Joseph's dream was so far out that his brothers even had to say, so we're going to bow to you? Is that what your dream is all about? Please, dreams are what we need. It's important to have something to hope for. It's important to have something that gets you up on the morning and causes you to breathe. It wasn't that Joseph's dream was so all-encompassing. It was the fact that his brothers had no dreams at all. They were jealous, and jealousy has never been about the other person. It has been the juxtaposition of that against the backdrop of what was missing in our own lives and in the lives of the brother. Have a dream. We closed our open breakfast during COVID. And recently, we had a member in the community to approach us and say, maybe we should consider reopening. This was someone not in our church, but it was someone that brought an idea to us And we began to have a discussion because we are a community that doesn't like to discourage people. And so we had a meeting and we began to talk. And because of our openness, we began to plan 
And finally, that talking and that conversation and someone not in our church bringing an idea, we came up with open breakfast on the patio. And it was beautiful. It didn't start out that way, but we were open and we allowed the stream of conversation and gifts to work together. And I dare say it was well orchestrated and implemented because one person dared, dared to dream, dared to put themselves out there. So ask God for a dream. Ask God to give your life purpose. Ask God what you can do for others and not always what God can do for you. Have a dream that's big enough for you and all the people you know. Have a dream that expands the capacity of your lungs to breathe deeply. Have a dream that involves God's hope for creation. Have a dream that puts itself in the middle of people and justice. Have a dream that allows you not only to see the surface of people, but the depth and the stories and the path of weary feet. Have a dream that allows you to call every human a sister or a brother or whatever personal pronouns they ask you to call them. Have a dream worth living for that invites others to join and to hope again, that it does not rest on where we have been, but where we could possibly go. Have a dream that includes the left and the right, the brown and the white, the rich and the poor, the urban and suburban. Have a dream that includes the Muslim, the Jew, the atheist, the heretic, and the syncretist religious. Have a dream that includes those who were robbed of their capacity to dream. Have a dream for those who have been shitted on again and again. Have a dream that invites all of us to the tables, all the voices, especially those voices we rarely hear. Have a dream that includes the children of Hagar, the children of Liga, the children of Tatiana, and all the baby mamas. We speak Joseph sibling names, Reuben, and Simeon, and Dan, and Judah, and Naphtalia, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulon, Dina, their only daughter, and Benjamin. Say their names and have a dream for them. We need dreams that live into the new normal, for there is no turning back for us. Have a dream that lifts those in despair have a dream that opens the eyes of the blind. Have a dream that extends beyond us to the stars. Let's dream of a new earth and a new heaven. Have a dream. Amen.
that one man scorned and covered with scars still strove with his last ounce of courage to offering time and in the epistles there's a scripture that says that God loves a generous giver that means kind of like when you give you don't give stingily or you don't give with an attitude but you actually give you give and you give with a spirit of generosity many of you have been faithful over the weeks and the months and we invite you to do the same to be generous and to share and to give with a giving heart. There are three ways you can give. They should be up on the screen. You can give electronically, you can mail it, or you can stop by the office. We invite you to share your financial resources, and we continue to invite you to share our Facebook Live page with others as well. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gifts that lay in our possession. We thank you for all the ways that you have blessed us. And we thank you for the ways in which we share a portion of those blessings with our community of faith. May your world be richer. May your world be better. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello, United. Last night, someone sent me a video. It was a very interesting video. It was a video of events that were happening right here in front of our church late last night. First, I was a little taken. At first, I, you know, I was like, is that our church? There was a lady out. She had her boom box. She had her mic. And she was singing some Motown stuff. Oh, cool. She was going down. So there was, a, there was a community, and some had on masks, and some were practicing social distance. She had a bucket, and people were giving generously, and one person even reached in to say, what is your cash app address? Do you have a cash app? And she was working it, and this person recorded two of her selections, 
I have always known that outdoors is where our ministry is. We come to church, we come to these spaces to connect and to be in community. But the real work of the church is not here, it's not even in your home. It's outside of ourselves. And so I want to encourage you this week when I talk about faith and action, I'm going to push you to do something comfortable and share some component of your faith story. This week somebody asked me, how did you become a pastor? I'm sure that's an interesting question a lot of folks would like to know. <laughs> and anyway, I began to share. And that's all I have to do. I'm going to share my story tomorrow as well. Just share a component of your story because your story actually can bless someone. If you're tuning into our Facebook page, you notice that we are launching a podcast and we are sharing people's story. Your story is powerful. Sometimes we feel inhibited, especially as progressive Christians. So I want to encourage you for faith in action to really get outside your comfort zone, whether it's an email or a phone call. I don't want you to call the people you always call and you love to talk to and stay on the phone. I want you to reach out to someone different, someone you're not as comfortable with and share your faith story and listen. That is your task for faith in action this week. It is so good to have you all with us today. We are coming to the end of our space together. You can stay with us after service. We have a coffee hour and the Zoom information will come up on the screen. But we thank you for joining us today and let us now have our closing hymn and after that will be the benediction. till we meet again by his counsels guide uphold you with his sheep securely fold you God be with you till we meet again till we meet till we meet till we meet at Jesus feet May our God provide light to your path. May our God guide you. May our God give purpose to your life. And may you dream big. Dream really, really big. Go forth into the world and be uncomfortable. And share your story and share your testimony and be a light. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen.